Hello, and welcome to the Days of Learning podcast and live event shows. I'm David Nelson, and I am so glad that we are here today with you to talk about health, wellness, medicine, and community engagement. As we continue on our series, our, our, our Back to the Kitchen takeover series, I am a, once again joined by my colleague and good friend, Yvonne D. Greer, owner of the Y E Right Nutrition Services. Welcome, Yvonne. Good to see you again. Nice seeing you today as well. Yvonne, we've had a quite a we've had some fun on our shows, and, and I think the fun is going to continue today. Uh, we're going to be exploring a new topic. And so tell us a little bit about what we have in store today on this Back to the Kitchen Takeover series. Well, our theme for the day is Back to the Kitchen with Protein. And today we're going to be exploring the various proteins, but we're going to be keying on looking at um, developing a recipe made with TVP, textured vegetable protein. We're also going to have the question of the day. And our question is too much or too little? How much protein should I be getting in? And for many, many people, you know, protein, they think of meat, but there are so many other protein sources. And also sometimes people don't know whether they're actually getting enough in or too much in. So we're going to explore that. But in the chat, because we've already always been um, having people do some things because we want to put your name into a drawing. And we're going to be having a drawing for a self-measured uh, blood pressure uh, monitor. And so and we have two that we're going to be drawing. We want to get people's names in there. So to get your name put in for the drawing, all you need to do is give us your first name, an email, or a phone number. And put in there the types of protein that you consume. And all you have to say is, do you think you're getting too much, too little, or just right? Okay. The other thing I wanted to make sure people know is that you're going to be seeing a lot of different um, links that are coming up into the chat. And those links are going to be because we are really trying to promote heart health and diabetes health, diabetes prevention, control, self-management, uh, heart disease you know, self-management through nutrition and um, healthy practices. So in the chat, there's going to be a pre-diabetes um, risk test that you can take. So you're going to be able to see that periodically. Again, you know, our curriculum, Back to the Kitchen, is also put in the chat. But I just wanted to mention, you may see some other things like your chronic disease prevention resources, links to that. Also, um, the check change control, the heart disease program, a link for that for controlling cholesterol. And then also information on how do I do a, uh, a self-measured a blood pressure check at home and some how-tos on that and some links on that. So I just want to mention that so that people know that, you know, we are doing this so that we want um, to kind of get you motivated around nutrition. This is the last day of National Nutrition Month. And, you know, all of our, our talks have been positive about eating healthy, but we're going to be entering into Minority Health Month next month. So we're going oh, to continue fabulous. on with even more emphasis on the importance of eating healthy, having an active lifestyle to reduce chronic disease uh, risk, and also to control and, and manage chronic diseases. So I'm so happy that, you know, we're going to be, you know, continuing on, and I'm happy for what we're going to be presenting to you today. I really like that. And, and I want to ask you before we go with the video. Mm -hmm. these these things that we're talking about fruits and vegetables and grains and protein you're not just making this up but you follow a particular set of guidelines don't you could you tell the audience how you get this information and, and how it might be available for everybody 
Well, this information, every five years, the um, United States have a law wherein they develop dietary guidelines through the Department of Health and Human Services in conjunction with the USDA, the, the um, Department of Agriculture. And so every five years, they look at the evidence, they look at what nutrients are missing. They're even doing things like uh, modeling to say what combinations of foods are going to get you to that nutrition within a good um, um, cost level. So they're doing a lot of things to come up with dietary guidelines. And they just put out the new dietary guidelines for 2020 to 2025. And those dietary guidelines reinforce and relook at what is the main um, I, uh, foods that we should be eating. And they now say we should be concentrating on nutrient dense foods, foods that have a lot of nutrition with a lower amount of calories or a, within the calories that they contain, but they have a, a high abundance of, a, of nutrients. And then also looking at meal plant patterns healthy meal patterns. And they're not saying that there's just one way to eat. We have the my plate that's been kind of like the standard of um, looking at the proportions in your plate. And so they have um, come out with my plate, but they also have now reaffirmed that the vegetarian diet is a healthy dietary plan, um, pattern that is loaded with nutrient dense foods. The Mediterranean diet pattern is loaded with healthy foods and healthy nutrients. And so there's not just one way of eating, but those nutrient dense foods should make the base of any of your dietary patterns that you choose to eat. We're gonna talk about this in a future episode, but you, you, you've taught me that when you, you go shopping, that, that you, if you want these, as you say, these nutrient dense foods, to get the ones that are in their natural state. Isn't that what you're saying and that they're what you want people to follow? Yes, they, they usually say as natural as possible. And then they also say with minimally processed. So say for instance, if you wanted to get some carrot coins that's been frozen, that's minimally processed, it's not really been changed that much. Um, if you wanted to get, um, say, for instance, um, some chopped up lettuce, you can get that also. However, the more processing you do, you, 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 you run the risk of losing some of the nutrients. So that's why they really say the as close to natural as possible is best, minimally processed is, is, is second best. You know, isn't even it, isn't it true that even if you, if you, if you have something in its natural state, to use it, to eat it as soon as you are ready to, to go with it. So in other words, even cutting it and leaving it on the counter, it loses some of its, its nutrients. Is that correct? Yeah, it loses some of its nutrients over, over time. Some can escape to the air and that type of thing. You can leave it open to chemical contamination and it just deteriorates over time. So that's anything that, you know, that is um, picked, harvested, but um, it, it has the highest level of nutrient if you can get it as fresh as possible. Frozen is very good because it's frozen many times straight from the, from the um, farm and or even straight from the orchard. And so, you know, your frozen is next express. Say, for instance, if you had um, some lettuce that was uh, seemed like it was fresh, but sometimes because of, of, of travel, it's coming from a very, very long distance. It may have things on there to preserve it. So many times they say buy local to get the freshest and, and, and you know, the foods that's gonna last the longest is to buy more local where you don't have to have all that extra travel involved with where your food comes from. So know where your food comes from and, and that's a healthy way to um, shop. That's an awesome recommendation. And I know many times when you talk about the processing, to avoid foods like fruits and vegetables that are packed with extra sugar or extra or extra salt, right? And right. so if we can get them packed in water or right off the vine or nearly off the vine, then that's a better, that's better nutrition and more nutrition, nu nutrient dense. Right. And then some people are, are getting back into canning 
and, and putting up some of their own fruits and vegetables themselves. But uh, when you can eat seasonal fruits and vegetables straight from the vine, straight from the farmer, you're going to get the highest level of nutrition and flavor, you know? And so, you know, then that will make you even more satisfied with the foods that you choose to um, pick. There's a, you know, because of the way we do transportation and, and some things like um, uh, some of the refrigerated trucks and things coming up from the South, you know, you can have, you know, in America, you have fresh vegetable year round, but we do tend to see that the flavor is different when you're having foods out of season. So, you know, seasonal foods are the best. I mean, I had, <laughs> I had a squash the other day that I couldn't believe how nice and tasty and juicy it was. And I was like, well, what's wrong with this squash? It was in season. And I never mm. even thought something like a squash can change its flavor from season to season, but it does. You mentioned in the video, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but there's nothing like so satisfying as sitting in the garden and, and sitting on a piece of ground and grabbing a tomato off the vine and, and taking a big old bite, dirt and all. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, they always say wash stuff, but at the same time, I know that that, you know, I've done that taking a cherry straight off the cherry tree. Um, and it's been really tasty. But I'm trying to wash my vegetables, but when I'm in the garden, Miss Yvonne, I just I just take it and munch on it. I know a lot of people to do that as well. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pa I'm gonna pause us here though. I, you and mm -hmm. I could talk, but we're gonna bring our guests right. in a little bit. The video is ready, so uh, let's roll the video, and I hope you really enjoy this. But you'll enjoy this back to the kitchen around proteins. Go ahead and, and roll the video, uh, Chris and Kelsey. Good afternoon, and welcome back to the kitchen. I'm Yvonne Greer, registered dietitian and owner of Why Eat Right, nutritional consultant for healthy living. This program is being brought to you by MCOP, Milwaukee County Organization Promoting Prevention and the Medical College of Wisconsin, the State of Wisconsin's Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion Program through a CDC 1815 grant. This is the fourth session of the six part Days of Learning program that features a healthy recipe from the Back to the Kitchen curriculum. We will be having a recipe that is demonstrated as well as our invited guests who will share their insights on the importance of eating healthy and having an active lifestyle. Our program today is titled Back to the Kitchen with Protein. There is a variety of protein sources that you can consume in a healthy diet from your proteins and your meats poultry, your fish products, a variety of different types of beans with lentils having the highest protein level that you can be eating. But you also have your nuts and your seeds. And then there are soy products that you can buy in the market, like your Boca burgers and your Morning Star Farm products. But most of those prepared items already have sodium and seasonings added to it, so you will need to watch the nutrition labels and look for those sodium levels and get the ones with the lower amounts. You can also use textured vegetable protein. These are dry protein granules that can be reconstituted with water to resemble a meat product, but has no extra seasonings or flavorings in it. This is what we will be using with our recipe of today, our vegetarian spaghetti made with TVP. So let's get started. For our recipe, we'll be using the TVP, a whole wheat angel hair pasta, a Italian tomato paste, stewed tomatoes, our vegetables of onion and green pepper, and then our seasoning, thyme, garlic powder, and black pepper. So first we're going to get started with reconstituting the soy granules. To reconstitute the soy granules, all you would need to do is add them to the bowl, 
one cup equals a pound of equivalence to ground beef and then you add an equal part of one cup of water. It will reconstitute on its own. You sit this aside. Now it's time to put on the water. You want to have it on high so that it can come to a boil. So while the water is getting ready to boil, I'm going to prepare the vegetables, starting with the, your onion first. I have a little trick that I, I show people on how not to start crying with cutting the onion. First of all, you turn it to really cold and you get your hands and the knife as cold as possible. When you have cold hands with a cold knife, it does not stimulate the release of the onion smell and you can cut that onion with no worries. So I'm going to cut the onion in half. I didn't peel it first because I'm going to save the other piece of it and the onion does remain fresher when you leave some of the skin on if you're not going to use the other piece. I'm going to set that to the side. And then I'm going to peel all of these things off, cutting those outer areas. It makes it easier for those that outside to come off easy. If you smell anything, you just put your hands and the knife back under the water and it will just ease that up right away. I don't smell anything anymore. Should be able to, if your water's really cold, which it is, be able to last until you finish cutting it up and you should have no problem with the onion smell. So to cut the onion, I do the same thing that I usually do. Put my hands on both sides and you cut in between there. And then you just turn it and then you cut across and you make a nice diced onion very quickly. You're holding them together, you don't have to do them all separate. Then we'll do our green pepper. Again, I'm only I'm wanting a fourth of a cup of green pepper. I just kind of eyeball it for those starting. If you want to measure, that's fine. And then you'll be able to taste and know if you like a little bit more or a little bit less. And again, as we did before, turn it, hold it tight together, and then just cut across. That's the way you get it done quick easy and don't have to worry about it and again you can put those knuckles out do that last piece not worry about not worry about cutting your fingers up and there you go our water is now ready for the pasta and we're going to measure our pasta out all you have to do to measure the pasta is bring some of the pasta up and then see if it fits into the hole now that we have our pasta measured, it's time to put the pasta into the water. You just put it in and fan it out. You don't have to um, um, push it down. It will fan out on its own and, and go down as the, it gets moisturized and softened. I don't put any salt into, in the water. I usually, if salt is um, needed in the whole entire dish, I add that at the end. Some of the ingredients have some sodium in it, like your tomato, so I don't want to um, put any additional salt in the water. Now let's see what our PVP looks like. It's absorbed all of the water, and now it has the texture of ground turkey. Now we're ready for our sauce. First, we're going to be adding our tomato paste to our um, pot. And the tomato paste, this one has garlic and basil and oregano already in it. And I like this one because if you don't have a lot of soft, um, spices at home, this would be able to make a very good sauce. Although I do add my um, more ingredients to it, um, more spices to just make it more flavorful. One thing about this is that canned um, um, tomato products, they have been made with um, BPA free linings in the cans. They're GMO free. They've been ripened on the vine. So they are a very, very good source. The only thing you need to check in the ingredients is if you're getting a combination like your Italian sauce 
um, with all the seasonings, it may have Romano cheese, so it may have a milk product in there. That's something to keep in mind. Some people may not be thinking about that. But we would put this into the pan and then reconstitute that with the three cans of water. Don't worry if you don't get all of the tomato out the first time. It takes three cans of water and you just stir it up to get as much and get the rest of it out of the can. And then you're going to um, stir that and mix that in. We're going to put this now over the fire, over the burner and turn it on, on a medium flame so that it can bring it to a boil in a slower fashion. We're going to add our TVP right to the tomato paste and just stir it. This is in a raw state. All of that will need to cook out and cook down. I don't know if you're starting to see the little white foam that has been forming. We're going to add to that our onion and our green pepper. You don't need to cook those vegetables in butter first. That's what many people do. And to this, we are going to add our stewed tomatoes. And these stewed tomatoes have celery and onion already added to it. So you're actually layering different flavors together. And you see now you've got that nice tomatoes. And yum yum. <laughs> now we're going to add our spices. This is your thyme leaf. I have here an organic one. But this is kind of like an Italian spice. You can put, uh, I have it as a fourth of a teaspoon. You can put as much as you like, although I already know that I do like a little bit more. One thing about time, I always say you have to respect the time. If you go over in time, it's going to have a very, very strong flavor. So start off small at first until you know how much time you like. The other is the black pepper. And with the black pepper, you can sprinkle, but for our purposes, I'm just going to measure some out. And usually it's like a fourth of a teaspoon. Again, with pepper, you, it's all on what you like. My kids tend to tell me I like a lot of pepper, so I'm going to start right there. Just going to stir really nicely and get it all stirred together. We've taken our pasta off the heat and turned it off. We don't want it to get too soft. We want to make sure that it is al dente or a little bit softer than that. But again, that's something that it continues to cook even when it's not on the fire. Again, all of this will have to cook. Now, usually, I would say you cook it down once, and then you may put some more water and you cook it down the second time, and that way it when it's done. But all the water, you'll see it thicken, and this water will cook out. So we usually leave it, and we'll come back and see, you know, how it's how it's done in in a little while. See, it's starting, to, it's starting to cook. See how fast it's starting to cook? It usually takes about about 15 minutes. I didn't put any any oil or anything in there so that you, you really have, have a, this is all fat free right now. It's starting to come together really nice. We still need the green pepper to finish cooking. So you don't want to cook it too fast. 
I'm going to turn the, the heat down just a little bit to slow it down. And again, if the water runs out before you see the, the vegetables done, you just add more water to it. But this is coming together really good. But it's cooking kind of fast. So I'm going to turn it down just a little bit. During this time of year, the tomatoes are not as sweet. And so your tomato sauces and things may have a little bit of a more bitter taste. And that's where the optional sugar comes in if you wanted to add a little bit just to take the, the bite off of the, uh, and make it not so pungent. In the oh, it's starting to come together really good. Just a little bit longer. You see how thick it's getting? Yeah. Like I said, the next very next time it'll be done. It's been about 15 minutes. Okay, yes. See how the liquid has cooked down? Green pepper. See? Beautiful. Now it's ready. Beautiful. There we have it. Our vegetarian spaghetti with TVP and our whole, whole wheat pasta noodles. I've coupled that with a whole wheat garlic toast and a romaine salad with strawberries and walnuts. But, oh, we've got one more ingredient. Our Parmesan cheese. Now we're ready for our feast and on to our guests. Oh, once again, uh, Miss Yvonne, I need smell a vision and I could just, I could hear the, 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 the sauce simmering and I just wanted to smell it. And then somebody said, and you got to have the cheese. Really well done, a excellent video, good teaching and good learning on the simplicity of food. And food doesn't have to be really complex in order to be enjoyable. I want to back up a little bit because I think it's important, not only for uh, our listeners, but for me to learn from you about the science of protein. Yvonne, what is protein and, and why is it so important to our diets? Protein is one of the macronutrients, which we call the major food groups that provide calories and nutrition to our diet. Um, but many people think of protein, they think of meat, but protein is way more than just animal um, um, protein. And you have a wide variety of protein sources um, from your animal products of meat, um, poultry, fish, to your whole grains and uh, some of the whole grains, but also your nuts, your seeds, um, and all of those beans and those lentils. Those are very, very important sources of protein. Protein serves in many different areas of the body. I'm just going to read you a couple of things. And the reason why I'm reading this, these, um, uh, what I'm reading from is actually in the Back to the Kitchen, and it's in the Talking Points. So that all of um, um, anyone who downloaded can actually be able to really um, do programs, you know, read up on what is this giving you. So from the back to the kitchen, proteins uh, from come from many sources, but it also functions to um, help to develop bones, muscle, cartilage, skin, and your blood. They are building blocks of enzymes of hormones, of vitamins. They are, they, the proteins are also um, part of your, your whole system that is supporting the structure of your body. And so we think of your bones as supporting the structure, but that muscle around that bone is supporting that structure. And then you have those internal tissues that is all protein and um, hormones and things. So it's really in many different areas that you have that protein component. Um, the last program I got into all of the chemistry behind it. I don't want to do that today. I want to go into the nutrients behind it because mm -hmm. in those protein foods, you have vitamins, minerals, you have 
things like B vitamins, you have iron, you have B12, and many of those foods and substances you do need to get from your, your, the foods that you eat. And so when they call them essential, meaning that you, your body can't make them, you need to be able to take those nutrients in. And so you have so many, like your B vitamins, they help on your body with your release of energy. They have a role in your nervous system. They have a role in the foundation of red blood cells and on building tissue and in immunity. One thing, um, zinc is a very important source of nutrient and it, it really helps with so many of your bodily function, especially when it comes to your energy and your repair of tissues and, and um, building you know, your immune system. Meat is kind of like the, and, and what we call heme, heme sources is one of your main sources. However, you can get zinc from your beans and your, your, your other sources. It's just that sometimes they're not as bioavailable. So when you start looking at that, some of the things that are done like soaking, and heating, and then also fermenting, and some of those different ways that you can treat the, the, the um, items that have zinc in it from plant sources, it actually makes that zinc more bioavailable. So that's why I say, are you getting too much or too little? Because sometimes people think all vegetables are the same, and I don't have to even think about it. And you do need to know where are you getting your protein from? Even if you're getting it from plant sources, there is some plants that's higher in, in zinc, some, some plants that's, that's higher in iron, some plants that's higher in other nutrients and protein that you need to get in along with your green leafies and some of the other um, um, nutrients. You and the last old. thing I Go wanted ahead. to say mm -hmm. is that um, sometimes your seafood brings you some of those nutrients too. So that's where um, making sure you know, you know, where are you getting some of these uh, uh, important sources? Zinc is one, B12 is another big one. And that's another one that yeah, it sometimes can go low in people who are not paying attention. I really love the way you explained that and, and you didn't go too far down the chemistry path, which I think is, is great. Hard. But you spoke of these building blocks and the whole system of support from bones, muscle, cartilage, and, and, and even blood and, and having the, these macronutrients that are bioavailable. I, I want to ask you, because you've always you've been you've taught and and you speak from this perspective of a wide range of foods in your diet to have that variety whether it be eating the rainbow or getting your protein from a variety of sources can you tell the audience why this is so important because um your body systems depend on having those things available. And if, if they're available, then your body can react and, and it, there's things going on in your body that you don't even know of. And that's, those systems can function you know, at their most efficient way when you give them the nutrients that it needs to do that. And so when you're you know, not, we call it mindfully, eating mindfully, mm and knowing that you're getting the variety of different nutrients from a variety of different sources, um, then you usually don't have to start adding up numbers. That's a lot of people say, you know, how many milligrams of this? And how many milligrams of that? And I mean, some people, they just function like that, but you don't have to function that way to get the nutrients in. It's that, that variety and understanding that not every food is giving you the same thing. And so um, in the dietary guidelines, they came up with the my plate to give people kind of an idea of what the balance should be, like half your plate being fruits and vegetable, only one fourth being grains and another one fourth being meat, where the whole half a plate isn't meat, only one corner of it's meat. And then you can fill in with um, the others, knowing that fruits and vegetables should be your mainstay and some grains to fill in as well. Um, there's, an, there's one saying that says that 
carbohydrates can spare protein to be used for, for, you know, building tissue and that type of thing. But if you don't have a good combination of different things, your protein could just be burned for energy and not be used to build your tissues and that type of thing. And then people who think they're eating the healthiest might actually be, have lower immune system than other people. Mm. So that's where that having that balance, having that wide variety of nutrient, eating the colors of the rainbows and making sure you know where your protein is coming from, that makes for a healthy eating pattern. And that pattern is what we're trying to get, a pattern that gives those nutrient dense foods in different places and have a balance that's going to keep you healthy. Yeah, but it, it doesn't mean you have to add up numbers. You know, that idea of being mindful, and, and before we get to our guests, I do want to have one, you want to comment one more question. I was out for um, my exercise today um, before the show, and I was thinking about the show, and, and I was thinking about the video, and people often think about having to give up things, right, in order to change their diet, or they don't get to enjoy food any longer. <laughs> You really speak into both the simplicity of food and even something like stewed tomatoes that are coming out of a can are, are, nu are nutrient dense. Yes. Wasn't any added sugar or salt. You added your spices. So people don't have to give up a lot to eat well. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. And actually, as you start learning how to enjoy healthy food, you actually are bringing in more things you're not really giving up. And it's, that's mm -hmm. a lot of people do think they're giving up. And I don't ever think anyone has to give up anything. I mean, you could choose not to eat it. It's not that you're giving it up. You're making a conscious choice. Because I, you know, I always, in any program I do, even if it's in person, I always tell my truth because I want people to know I'm human. My favorite, favorite thing of all times, <laughs> and I know my daughter's on here, I love fried chicken. <laughs> There's never going to be a day that I'm going to say I don't like fried chicken. But when I started thinking way years ago, fried chicken isn't the only way you can have chicken. If you really like chicken, you can eat stewed chicken. You can eat broiled. You can eat curry chicken. You can have chicken soups and different. You don't just have to have fried chicken. And guess what? I don't even buy oil to fry chicken like that. Not to say that I don't ever eat it. I just don't, you know, that's not what I usually do. I mean, I might pan broil something or, you know, get it started and put some water in. It's just, you know, a lifestyle change. But did I ever feel like I'm giving it up? No, because, you know, I always say you have the choice. It's your choice. And you can choose to say, I'm going to like that, but I just don't have to have it all the time. It's part of that being mindful. It's part of the, 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 the intention of eating. Miss Yvonne Greer, you are just a joy, and I always learn something new from you. Your tips and, and, and hacks on how to cut an onion and other things are just so precious. Uh, we're going to have to write a book on those things and, and let everybody the world know that how we can do this. But thank you for that video today. Thank you for taking us back to the kitchen. Hey, should we bring our guests into, the, into this discussion? Yes, and I have to admit something. I did not download all of the bios. My goodness. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe I, have... does that mean I get to do it then? Yes, it does. And then we can, we can, I can join in because they, they know I know them, even if I don't have their bio. But yes, okay. if you have it in front of you, that would, that would be a help. It would be an honor for me to do so. First <laughs> up is, is, is our friend, Ms. Venus Williams. Welcome, Ms. Hello. Venus Williams. Welcome, thank you for having me. What a joy to see you. Venus Williams is the executive director of Alice's Garden and its visionary leader. She is the cultural and spiritual midwife at Clara Healing Institute, mm -hmm. curator of the Kujagulia Producers <laughs> Cooperative. <laughs> see, you have to learn, you learn the African word, Kujagulia. Thank you. <laughs> I, I hope you'll forgive any, any, and if I didn't do it quite well enough. And Minister for the Table, a first century st style community in the 21st century. She strongly believes she wants, she was put in creation to, to help bring forth all that is good and whole in people and places. She has been doing just that in Milwaukee for the past 
32 years. Welcome, <laughs> Venus Williams. <laughs> Thank you. Next, Vegan Soul is a personal chef catering business specializing in tasteful vegan food. It is the brainchild of Zakiya Courtney, a mother of blended extended family of 15, grandmother of 52, great grandmother of, to 16. She is a wife of 43 years, an educator by profession, yeah. cultural community activist by heart, preparing vegan comfort foods is her passion. Zakiya proudly says, I can veganize anything. <laughs> With over 49 years of experience preparing food for a large family, Zakia had to learn quickly how to prepare delicious, soulful, vegetarian, vegan food for her children when the family decided to change their diet 29 years ago. Family and friends increasingly asked Zakia for her vegetarian, vegan food at family and community events. The most popular request for her nine layer salad made from scratch, biscuits, Southern style greens and peanut <laughs> stew. After winning several Greens cook-offs challenges and doing live food demos for Fondi Market Milwaukee, the quest for tasty vegan food, reminisce of familiar comfort foods, grew exponentially. Zakia Courtney and her food was so well received at the Body and Soul Center and Alice's Garden that her passion grew into the personal <laughs> chef catering business, Vegan Soul. She is also the featured chef on Vegan Soul Fridays at Trickle Bee Cafe, a pay what you can restaurant in Milwaukee. Most recently, Zakia had, had the honor of participating and preparing food with six other chefs at a community dinner for Michael W. Twitty, author of The Cooking Gene and food blog Afrocolonia, and a prestigious VIP pop up at the 2019 Farm Aid concert. Zaki and Vegan Soul have been featured in the Milwaukee Journal Central and Black Women 50 Plus and Healthy Lifestyles Magazine. Welcome, Zakia. Thank you. Thank you. What Happy to be here. A Joya Courtney, aka Chef Joya, was introduced to vegan, veganism at age seven, is an award-winning plant-based chef in Charlotte, North Carolina, who specializes in vegan cuisine, incorporating soul food, Afro-Caribbean. French and African cultural influences. Chef Joya has recently been named both best chef and best vegan chef in Charlotte All by right. Queen City Nerve Alternate Weekly and is arguably yeah. one of the best vegan culinary artists in all of the United States. I'm getting chilled. She is <laughs> re revered by both vegans and non-vegans alike. She is also known for helping her clients transition and is famous for her ability to veganize almost any dish that traditionally contains meat and animal products. She is the queen of transitioning meat eaters to plant-based living. Her popular pop-up dinners and monthly private events routinely sell out. For more detailed information about Chef Joya's work, honors, awards, and accolades can be found at www.cookingwithjoya.com. Welcome, Chef Joya. Uh-oh. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Well, David, that was wonderful. And as you were reading, I when I say community champions, I mean community champion mm -hmm. and now world champions. And I have to have to say, you know, each one, each one of you. I have, you know, Venus and Zakia have a personal relationship with you. Mm -hmm. Venus actually presented at the Wisconsin Dietetic, well, Wisconsin Academy of Nutrition and Dietetic, mm -hmm. my age is showing, um, <laughs> and she did a wonderful job on cooking with herbs and herbs as mm -hmm. uh, nutrition and food. And me and uh, Zakia Courtney has gone so a long way and mm -hmm. have been I've been I've been eating her food for years and her 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 um she's she's kind of like one of the mothers in the city in, in in the community mm -hmm. so you know she knows I've I've learned from her and my my daughter and my family have um benefited but I have to say mm -hmm. something about this this Miss Jeff Joya mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I, I I'm just flabbergasted she is a a chef to the stars she is a celebrity chef 
I was sitting there looking at Fantasia. And most people on here may or may not know Fantasia, but she was <laughs> one of the winners of American Idol. Mm -hmm. And I've been following her for years, I'm sitting there at home on a Tuesday. And all of a sudden she said, oh, I'm going to have a feast today. She said, because I got Chef Joya. And I'm thinking, Chef Joya? That sounds like Chef Joya. She said, yeah, cooking with Joya. And then she grabbed you and pulled you on screen. And I said, wait a minute. She over there cooking for Fantasia. I said, <laughs> I said, I am, I said, I didn't even know. And I don't know if you that if you said the connection of Chef <laughs> Joya and and Zakia, mother daughter. Mm -hmm. and now, you, may not, you may not have known. Did you, David? I did, but I was reading off the script because I didn't know I was going to have to read off the script. <laughs> right. Yes, I, I did know it. If I didn't say it, oh, it, it that's on me. No, but I, I, you know, this is, you're the second mother-daughter team that we've mm -hmm. had on Days of Learning. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to emphasize the idea that, you know, what you, what, what served in the home many times make more of an impression than what you ever, ever think. Right. You know, and now, you know, you've got a celebrity chef and you're a chef. And, you know, I know from Venus Williams that what was um, served and what was done in her home actually motivated her. So I don't know if you're ready for the first question, because I want to really get into them kind of telling us a little bit more. So mine was first question was tell us about what brought you to making the garden or cooking or you know promoting healthy eating your you know mission and and venus if i could start with you okay yeah again thanks for um having me zaki i miss you get your butt back home to milwaukee <laughs> <laughs> we, we, won't, we won't let people know that um she's been wintering elsewhere out of town mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. anyway uh when I think about food, I say all the time, uh, I was born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, recognizing there's more than one Pittsburgh, but my family um, origins on my paternal side go back to um, Old Cahaba, Alabama, which is was the first capital, um, and Selma, Alabama. And I come from a family of farmers and gardeners. So I grew up, there, there was no one in my family who did not have a garden, whether it was a huge garden or a small garden or a, a very large homestead. Um, I actually grew up in my first 11 years in a little town in Pittsburgh, still mill town called Homestead. And I like to say that because mm -hmm. by um, the time I reached mid adulthood, I became a homesteader. So fresh food, gardens, farms, um, cooking. My father was a chef. All of my siblings are chefs. And so you either and or um, you grew food and you created food. Uh, my sister's children are all chefs, um, wow. all working in uh, the kid, my youngest sister. And so food, I, I say I grew up in a family whose ethics were food, faith and community. And I just live right into that. Um, my father, before he passed and would come here and visit, or when I would go home to Pittsburgh and be working in my mother's gardens or my grandmother's gardens, he would sit and watch me and say, all that education, and I was raising a farmer. So <laughs> I'm a proud, proud, educated farmer, but it's, it's definitely in my blood, in my roots, um, and I'm honored to continue all of those traditions. Um, I, and I did want to say before you got off, my great grandfather, when he, when we were growing up, had a farm mm. at, out in Oak Creek, and I had to work the, the farm from little all the way through high school. So mm. I, I have roots and connections to the farm, and you never know how that's um, affecting you until you get older, and it probably really set it some of those seeds of me going into nutrition. What's that about? I, yes, Zakia. You know, uh, as I think about, and I was listening to, you know, Venus's story, and I was thinking about my connection, you know, with uh, farming or gardening or even the soil. And it really first came from uh, my father, who always had a, a garden. 
but I don't ever recall working in the garden. And I think the reason why is because the garden was his place of peace. Peace. He didn't have to deal with the rest of us, you know, when he was in, in that, that garden. But as I uh, uh, became an adult and started to learn, you know, more about the politics of food in particular, I had a friend who had a garden at uh, Parkline. She lived in Parkline Housing Project. And what she would do is that every year she would take and extend a little space out from around the side of the building, you know, for her garden. And you're not supposed to do that. You know, you weren't supposed to dig, you know, it's public housing. So you weren't supposed to dig up, you know, anything. But she would do it a little bit, a little bit, a little bit till it got really, really big. Well, instead of uh, uh, department housing uh, chastising her, what it did was it, it became part of a video to show people how they could beautify the space in which they lived in. But I was so impressed with her. She had eight children. She was growing all this food that I said, okay, I'm gonna take my whole backyard and turn it into a garden. And I did. So it was like a small farm. I had no idea what I was doing, but I grew lots of stuff, including uh, cantaloupe. But then I got involved in the workforce. Being involved in the workforce didn't give me the time that I really wanted to have to be in a garden. But I always said that once I retire, once I retire, I was gonna go full steam ahead from my backyard to uh, uh, something else. I didn't know that something else was going to be Alice's garden, you uh-huh. know, which is my primary connection, you know, mm-hmm. with, with uh, Venus. And I was just so happy to be in that space because I couldn't envision having gardening away from your mm-hmm. home because it takes so much time. But Alice's garden, for those of you who do not know, is much more than a garden. Right. It is a community. It's representative of what the world ought to look like. And so you really enjoy being at this place that is a, an oasis in the midst of everything else, you know, that happens in an a urban area. And so also too, in my bio, when I talked about body and soul, that was Venus's um, uh, center. I think Venus had a plan in mind when she asked me to, uh, uh, would you like to cook? You know, would you like to, you know, would you like to sell some food? And I'm like, hmm, okay, you know, and, I did it. And then, you know, that's where it really, really started to pick up with people, you know, asking, you know, for the demand. Um, I'm almost forgetting what the question is now because I'm thinking so much about the history and the connections. And uh, Venus talked about me wintering in uh, uh, North Carolina, which I did. Uh, I didn't intend it like that, but I haven't been idle since I've been here. I've been cooking with my daughter. You know, I've actually served as her shoe sous chef you know which i was surprised i could do but i did and i've learned so much and i'm so excited oh yeah venus you know how it is working with your daughter you too (laughs) you know how it is working with your daughter right i know i'm working on the line i'm (laughs) working with her right now so proud right Um, right right so the mother daughter thing i mean we can always learn something you know which is really good and all of us you know as mothers are open you know to that learning so that we learn uh from our daughters who have have evolved, I would say, because I, I know all of them, you know, so they have evolved into, you know, beautiful young women and it's given us an opportunity to see them elevate, you know, those things that we planted as seeds early on. Do, do I need to repeat the question? I think, yeah. that, like I said, <laughs> like I said, it's, it's, it, this is a conversation. So I think you really have kind of answered it. The um, the question was, um, tell us about um, uh, what brought you to promoting healthy eating um, and and brought you to the mission that you have today. Okay, so I add add one more thing. I did almost hit it on the head. But, you know, just about 30 years ago, we started to learn more about uh, uh, food and the impact it has on your body and and your health. And I actually tried being vegetarian when I was about 22 years old. And I have no idea what I was doing, didn't have no support. So that attempt didn't last long. 30 years ago, not only did I have more support, but there was just more information out there about the impact that uh, uh, animal products have on, on your body. And my husband uh, was diagnosed at that time with being borderline di- diabetic and uh, hypertension. And the doctors told him he could either change his diet you know, or go on medication. And he wasn't ready to go on medication, you know, at the, uh, at the time. And so uh, we changed our diet, which was a huge step for him because he ate everything. You know, me, I had that, by that point, I had, you know, narrowed down 
to just a, a, a few items that I was consuming. But that's what led me, you know, that's what led me in that direction. That's what has kept me in my direction, in that direction. And as Joya would can tell the story, uh, she could pick up from here that uh, she was seven years old when uh, we started. We had about six children at home and it wasn't an easy transition, you know, uh, because some of them were like teenagers and we were like, this is what we're going to do. We'll no longer consume meat, you know, in a house, but we know we can't control what it is that you do outside Mm -hmm. a house. My goal, though, as uh, uh, the person who was in charge of preparing food for the family was to make whatever it is that was their favorite food and they had become accustomed to as good or better than what it was they had before. So Yvonne, like when you were making that spaghetti, that was one of the first things. That that was one of the first things, you know, that we had changed. So that's where my my journey started and uh, stayed. All right. And I'm going to say something about Chef Joya before I turn it over to you, is that I read, and Vanessa, my daughter, Vanessa Johnson, I know you know her, Mm -hmm. she had purchased all three of the books that you had, and I read the opening and heard so much about your journey to what you're doing today, and I wanted to um, give that little bit in because you have really taken hold and made this a major mission for you. So if you could tell us a little bit more about how you transitioned into um, your what you're doing today. Yes, of course. Um, so of course, you know, the, the, you know, had no choice to become but become vegan at seven years old because that's what my parents did. Um, but then as a teenager and a young adult, I started doing the things that I wanted to do and I was eating everything. <laughs> I became a foodie and it was, it actually was a good experience for, for me now when I look back at it, mm-hmm. um, because about three years ago, um, when I first started getting into my personal chef and business, because I've been a makeup artist for 15 years, and I guess I'll say like four years ago, and I would just mm-hmm. like post pictures of food on like Facebook and things of that nature. People were like, oh, goodness, that look good. You should do a cooking class. And I'm like, okay, my job was not like a chef like at the time and so I, I came back to Milwaukee to do a cooking class and your daughter she was there <laughs> yeah I know I heard about it <laughs> yeah and everybody loved it they really really loved it so I was like okay and then I started like just selling food there it was just like because I I didn't realize what was happening at the time and so when mm-hmm. I was at that time I was still doing meat and um uh, vegan. And I knew how to do vegan food because I was raised, you know, off of vegan food. So when I came back, I was um, back in um, um, Charlotte for a while. I got a mentor and she had one vegan and she, uh, and she told me about some food that she tried and she thought it was like the best thing ever. And I was like, no, <laughs> I, had that food. I was like, okay, let me show you what the food is supposed to taste like. So I made her some food and she was just like blown away. And she was like, this is what you need to be doing. I was like, I don't want to be a vegan chef. And it was like, I was hard to argue about being a vegan chef. And so at that time, um, there was a competition for like a vegan mac and cheese competition. Let's just say, long story short, I won. I kept winning and kept winning and kept winning. And so I started um, growing not only a bigger Charlotte presence, um, I started doing more on social media with it. And by me doing more on social media with it, I had my clients, my private clients. I was like, you know what? Let me challenge you all to be vegan for 30 days. And it's like, okay, I'll do it with you just to make it easier. And so I will prep their meals for 30 days. I will even like be a chef to people on the internet. And I would give them free meal plans, like plan out their entire meals and uh, give them recipes and things of that nature. So all of that just started taking on an interest in the stuff. And I was like, okay, people are really wanting this. People really have questions. People, you know, so it was like something that was really, people were really interested in. And then I just continued to do it, continue doing those things. And it was like the very next year, it was just like the vegan world just like blew up. Like we've been here, but the interest and everybody wants to talk about it. Celebrities were changing to the vegan lifestyle. It was all over the news, magazine articles, recipes, chefs here, there, and everywhere. So it's just, it's just been a constant, um, just a constant growth in the vegan community, especially with, I'll say, trendsetters or even like the younger community community when people being more interested in it and the way that I cook food is you know like you hear my mom will say uh she can veganize anything I'm 
exactly that way. It's like, I do like any and everything vegan. I take pride in making like international cuisines, um, comfort cuisines, anything, anything that you can think of that reminds you of your childhood. I love to do that. I love to do a vegan and keep it authentic. I keep the flavors authentic and you pretty much can't even tell the difference. Yeah, one I, I heard about uh, Monique raving yeah. over your kind of vegan um, shrimp and she didn't uh -huh. know how you could ever even make it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I I am just so happy that you three were able to come. Um, like you said, the garden is more than a garden. The influences that have been um, passed on down from generation to generation. And as you said, that the vegan lifestyle has um, just come and you know it was something that was always here but it is something that is really transforming how people are eating today and mm -hmm. I had um one person on who talked about how 50 percent of her business at a chicken place is all for vegan food mm. so that is very very important to know that it is this is not a fad this is popular this is how people are living their life mm -hmm. all right and, you know, one of the things that we don't do is that uh, we don't hate on people who still consume meat. As you were talking about that earlier, that uh, Yvonne, that it's a choice. And we recognize that that is a choice that people make. And, you know, and so when people come to us with uh, uh, some want to change, some want to uh, be able to have healthier meals. I think one of the uh, biggest requests is how to have healthy meals for their children because they're trying to get away from, you know, all the fast food stuff. So there's lots of people that come for lots of different reasons. And mm -hmm. we're just here to help people along on their journey, wherever it is that their journey has taken them. Right. Mm -hmm. And now they have names for that. They have some that call themselves flexitarians. <laughs> that they, that they flex whatever they feel like for the day, but they are eating more of a vegetarian lifestyle on a more of a regular basis. Some people used to call it semi. I, I usually just say I eat what I like and many times what I like is vegan food. And that's, what, you know, so I don't call, I'm, I'm put myself in a box on anything. Um, one thing that I did also write down is, can you just go through because we talked about the types of protein. And one reason why I brought up the protein so much is that I've had people who want to start eating more of a vegetarian or vegan lifestyle, and they had no idea that they would have to concentrate on what is protein in a vegan diet. So if each one of you can just say what types of proteins that you use and what type of meat or protein alternatives do you, do you use to make some of the things that you're making? Because again, being seeds, different things can bring protein, but we also have other kind of alternative type foods that's being um, promoted. So anybody want to go first? Venus, you want to start? If you all want me to. Um, so again, you know, being raised around people who just grew so much food, beans, beans, beans. There was no, I never walked into my great grandmother's kitchen, my paternal, I was fortunate enough to have a full set of great grandparents, both sets of, of grandparents. Um, our family is huge, um, just like the Courtney's. Um, we were doing a count a couple of weeks ago and we stopped at 265 of us still Ooh. going strong. Wow, um, wonderful. It's, it's huge, but beans. So I wanted to show um, this is called the Great Bean Book and it's by Elizabeth Berry. And I don't know if it still exists. I'll write it down. Yep. I don't know if copyright is 1999. Um, but I could not walk into uh, any of these homes, my great grandmother's homes, my grandmother's homes, my, our own house, and there wasn't a pot of beans going, right? Mm -hmm. And so what cracks me up very often is when we talk about this new lifestyle or mm -hmm. alternative lifestyle. And for some of us, um, now, very often there was some meat in that pot of beans, right? So okay. we may not have, um, always have that, that meat source in there. And there's so many other things you can do to flavor um, the beans. But this, I tell people, if you can find this great bean book, beans are a huge source of proteins for me. And I always have cashews and um, all types of nuts 
in place. But as a farmer, um, you can't see this. This is this is my I put my seeds, my beans in these boxes, these glass boxes that were designed for crystals because the seeds are my crystals. They are my gem. And um, I just want to encourage, like with most things, if you choose, you know, if you if you grow things and invest in them, you appreciate them more. Um, so beans are my thing. This is, uh, and, and, and so key, I know what's going to happen after it's like Venus, I need some of those bean seeds, right? Because the bean is the seed, is the bean is the seed. That's right. Um, so some of my favorites are, you can't see them, but this tiger eye bean, uh, Zaki, I have to give you some of those. This Jacob's cattle bean mm -hmm. that I grow, um, wonderful. And I do mainly all heirloom beans um, as I'm growing them. Uh, what else is in here? I don't have my Christmas lima. My Christmas lima is one of my favorites. Um, and the dragon's tongue, I think you've seen that one before. I have. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just the, the, the pod itself is so beautiful. You don't even do it. But don't overlook um, the beans. I have some pink-eyed, uh, pink-eyed, black-eyed peas. Mm -hmm. Beans and peas are my greatest source of protein along with um, nuts. I am not vegan. Um, so much of my diet, probably my diet is 80% vegan. Um, our daughter Sojourner, and I, there are lots more. I have about three of these, so we won't go into all of that. Our daughter <laughs> Sojourner, when she was three years old, three years old, she came home from school. I had baked some chicken because I was never big on frying things. And she picked up the, the chicken leg like this. At, and she had a little lips. And she said, this was once alive. I can't <laughs> eat it. <laughs> this was once alive. Oh and it is because we had been been raised on so much fresh food from the garden, we just didn't eat a lot. And I never um, ate much red meat at all in my life. And and so when I cut that out, you know, however many years ago, 20 years ago, all that to say um, the beauty, the variety of beans as a source and fresh beans, uh, that's really my biggest protein source because you can just you can eat them um, all different kinds for every day of the year. No joke, right? There are just yeah. so many um, different kinds of beans. Um, if you're interested in ordering bean seeds or beans, it might be a little harder because everyone's just like um, Chef Joya when everybody got into the vegan thing, you know, when everyone started growing food. But in during the pandemic, for the very first time <laughs> last year, most nurseries and garden sources sold out of so much stuff. But um, I will say the best places for me, um, sources for bean seeds, um, if you needed to get some are um, Seed Savers Exchange and uh, what's that, Baker's? Baker's Baker Seed, Arrow, yeah. yeah. Baker Creek, um, I don't know what they have in. I haven't had to purchase bean seeds in almost a decade. Wow. Because I saved my seeds. But that's a whole other conversation. Um, so for me, my largest source of um, protein is beans. And you can just have so much fun. So I, it, it seems like, um, Zakia, we're going to have to have a bean day in the garden this year, cooking with beans. Sounds and, good. Um, and that would be wonderful. To, Make sure I know. You to come. Yeah, no, we're going to invite you to come. We're going to work you. <laughs> I, got a, I got a good navy bean soup that is kind of like my signature. So All, All right. right. All right. So, right. Zakia, what kind of protein um, sources do you use? Well, obviously, uh, beans and Joya. I'm going to have uh, Joya chime in on this because I rated her uh, cabinet <laughs> for the sources that we, we currently, you know, that we just had on hand. You know, we didn't go shopping mm -hmm. for anything. And while Lena said, you know, dried beans are, are the best source and the fresh source, sometimes, you know, especially when you're in a hurry, you may have to do you know, canned beans and garbanzo is one of them because they, or chickpeas, because they take forever 
to cook, you know, for, for, they do, they take forever to cook from scratch, right? But uh, this is like a main, uh, one of the main beans that we use. And I've learned a lot from, from Joya since I've been down here this winter in terms of using this. And I told her one time, she reminded me of, uh, uh, of Tom Hanks in, in uh, uh, with the uh, all the different kinds of shrimp, all the different Forrest kinds of things. You can, yeah, for right. <laughs> That's the way she is with these chickpeas. I'm like, oh my God, you know, barbecue chickpeas, you know, <laughs> you know uh, Caribbean, you know, there's just so many things that, that we uh, I've learned from using chickpeas this, this winter that uh, I can't wait, you know, go ahead and share it with you. Joe, you want to say anything about it? About uh, chickpeas or just beans? Well, beans, whatever. Yeah. Um, well, I use so many different protein sources because, you know, I cook for so many different people and some people have different allergies, but, you know, one of my favorite um, proteins to cook with is the satan, which is the vital wheat gluten flour. Mm. flour. Um, and uh, can I stop you? You, you? Could you say that again? Because you were going in and out and I'm, I'm trying to write it down. What type okay. of, was that satan? So, <laughs> satan. Are you... Say it one more time. The tan. The tan. Yeah, okay. and it's vital wheat gluten flour. It's the uh, protein um, in the flour, and it's like one of the highest um, sources in uh, uh, protein with vegan eating. But if you got a gluten allergy, then you can't <laughs> you can't eat it. Um, but I absolutely love working with that. Um, I love working with uh, tofu as well. Um, that, that's a really good source of protein. Um, and then lentils. Um, I, I have plant, lentils is really high in protein. I work with those a lot. I don't like lentils, <laughs> but so yeah, I don't. Most of my clients love lentils. It's just, it's just a me thing. I think that I experienced when my mom was how to work. You know, when you eat some when you're younger and, and you just can't eat it ever again. <laughs> <laughs> what you trying to say? <laughs> Uh oh, learning. This was years ago. You were learning. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> um, do you usually order that from the um from a mail order? Where do you usually get your your that Anthony's? The Anthony's, yeah. Oh, so I um I get Anthony's off of Amazon. So there's so many oh. different the vital wheat gluten flour like Bob Mills make it. I know Milwaukee. Can't you still go to Outpost and get yes. vital wheat flour, Mom? Okay. You can, you can, but this is the best. This is the best I've used. Okay. I absolutely love the Anthony, um, because first of all, the price and the yeah, but they're all the consistencies are different. Um, mm. I love the price and I love the consistency. Um, there. So David, did you have something? I'm I'm looking at our time. I don't want to. I could I can take this over, is... take over. But <laughs> yeah. well, let, let me uh, say say a couple more things about protein okay. sources because uh, because this is one of my favorite ones, and that's peanut butter. That's right. You know, when people talk, I mean, there's so many things that you could do with peanut butter, and just like Joya's signature dish is the mac and cheese, my signature dish is peanut stew. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's my si too. signature dish. There is tofu. Most people know about tofu, but a lot of people don't know about the dried bean curd. Okay. Uh, this is something that even most vegetarians, would you say, Joy, most vegetarians don't know about or vegans don't know about the dried bean curd? Yeah. And so uh, we do really interesting things with this from making it taste like chicken, fried chicken, okay. Yvonne, you know, to uh, okay. to fried fish. I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to have you over, especially, you know, for that. Okay. Uh, I want it. I want it. Jack fruit. So that the chips oh. And <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> You're right. We've even made it made it uh we can make this take this product product and make it similar to um chitlins. I said it has the taste oh. and the texture, but not the stink. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay. Yvonne, they're going to prove that to us. That's just a challenge so we can eat some. Yeah, we yeah, <laughs> we we're going to have to see about that one. That's right. Yeah. Jackfruit, you know, is really uh, popular right now. Again, I find most people don't know how, how to cook with it. Um, first time I, I had it, it was a sample. It was, it was already processed and made. And I'm like, this is nasty. 
you know, and then I decided to go ahead and take another chance. You can buy it fresh, but there's no need to. It's better, you know, in a can. This is a fruit. Okay, this is a fruit by nature. And we're also doing the same thing with banana blossoms. All yeah, right. I've, I've had that. You've had that, yeah. And we find those products in the uh, international markets, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Venus covered nuts and seeds, and I'm not gonna, gonna cover those. But you know, there's so many options that we have now. And like Joy and I always say, you know, you name it, we got a substitute for you. We got you. You tell us what your favorite food is, we got you. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, fried chicken. <laughs> I did see I did see that um, um, show with Tabitha Brown who made the jackfruit mm -hmm. tacos, and the only thing I did have um, the cure. We looked at the at the thing, and because it is a fruit, it's not really high in protein, but yet it's used as a protein substitute. And if that's no problem, the only thing is maybe you'll have a bean dish on the side or some other way that you get your protein in. But remember. Every meal doesn't have to have a protein there. Mm -hmm. It's just that if your diet's varied enough and you're getting it in on a regular basis, those right. um, building blocks, your body can make some of the essential um, um, mm -hmm. proteins, mm -hmm. but you have to have mm -hmm. enough of different, you know, foods to make sure you're getting a, um, a, a, mm -hmm. what you call a complete array of amino acids from all different sources. So I don't want people to overly worry about protein, mm -hmm. but it's something that, you know, you do need to just think about where you're getting it in, in your diet throughout the day or within the week. So David, I'll come back to you. I'm gonna took over again. Oh man, I love it, and it, it, I keep learning, and I just love the the the, the community that we are creating here. And I'm, I'm now a big fan of Chef Joy and and, and Chef Jakia, but I've known Miss Williams for a while now. And Miss Williams, I got to say, I'm a big fan of yours, and mm -hmm. and you have challenged me to both change my diet and to change the way I look at food and to be an advocate for community around how we both produce and support community, especially when there is inequities in our community. Mm -hmm. But you said something I want you to, to speak about. And I think uh, Joya and, and Zakia will also have a comment on this. Mm -hmm. You made the comment, food, faith, and community. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I find a calling in this. Can you speak into that from your perspective of faith mm -hmm. and community? Mm -hmm. Well, from how I was raised and how I have learned to live into um, my vocation, meals are sacred. You know, food is sacred. And when we come together at table to share a meal, um, these are these are sacred, blessed moments. Whatever your belief system, if you if you are um, part of you know I worship the the oak tree um, or the soil or you know whether you're Buddhist or Muslim or Christian or whatever your your philosophy is, you have to understand the sacredness of food. Um, this incredible. Um, source uh, that just nourishes us. I say all the time when I'm talking about plant material, food, whether it be food, flowers, and flowers are food, um, that the creator just shows off all the time, right? And yeah. then we get to transform um, the, the things that come out of the earth and share them. And so we build community. There is no, there are no peoples who have not built community around sharing food. None. Uh, when you when you come together at table and you break bread, um, those are very sacred moments. And I think that part of now we're getting into something else, but part of the brokenness that we experience um, in the world is because we're just not sitting down mm, with one another. Right. Um, we're not we're not sharing. Um, so you know our families. You know I grew up eating at the table, our children, you know, grew up eating at the table. When my mother visits here from Pittsburgh, one of the things she says, I love coming um, to your home because you still eat together at the table. Mm -hmm. We don't do that 24 seven, right? We're not doing that for every meal, but um, we have been very intentional and, and in raising our children, that was, that was really important. So um, food, faith, and community go together. You you know, when you're breaking bread and, and, um, and even cooking, not even just 
not even just the eating, but the cooking. And Chef Joya and um, Chef Zakia can talk about this. Um, you share stories. Right. <laughs> you, you learn about one another when you are working with food. Um, and I'll just pause there and, you know, I don't know if Joya or Zakia have some other things to add, but it's it, food is sacred. Food mm -hmm. is whole. Joy, you want to go first? No. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, if you saw her on Instagram, the fact that she's so laid back and not talking now, you were like, what is going on? Okay. Anyway, yes, I agree. Uh, Venus with the uh, food, faith, and community. And I'll just add one more F in there, and that's family. You talked about mm -hmm. it. Uh, you're right. In our generation, there was no such thing as not sitting down at dinner. When dinner was ready, you came to the table. It, you know, it wasn't no stay in your room or I got soccer practice to go to or I don't feel like eating now. I put my food in the microwave, that kind of stuff. That didn't happen, you know, and you never questioned it. That was just the way, you know, that, that it was. And uh, when I raised uh, my kids, it was basically the same way. Now, lifestyles did start to get busier. You know, right. so there might have been a, a well, it wasn't soccer, it might have been a Kothi dance practice or something like that. But for the most part, we still, you yeah. know, maintain that tradition of, of dinner is done. Okay, dinner is done. That means you come to the table, you know, and eat. You don't take, get your plate and go to your room and look right. at your own TV. Right. You know, you know, that that just did not, you know, that just did not, not happen. Mm -hmm. um, what, what I, I have to, uh, we did in, in my little household we did the same thing and you know back in the day you didn't have you didn't have cell phone the uh, phone would no, ring no, no, and no. then oh no you couldn't talk during dinner time tell them you're eating dinner and they knew what that meant i can't talk we eating dinner right. and you, you tell them you call them later or whatever because you you know it was like almost like how dare they call during dinner time people knew not to call during dinner okay. time Right. It's a different. Yeah, it definitely. You know, so nobody had a cell phone. Well, cell phones weren't out. Right. Even if they were, you weren't going to sit there at the table on your cell phone, you know, while you're having dinner, nor are you going to look at TV. TV right. Our TV, um, growing up with our children, TV couldn't be on. Mm -hmm. And with cell phones, well, they didn't have cell phones. They were their little, that didn't, that didn't right, happen. Right. That wasn't a problem. Mm -hmm. That, that wasn't a problem. But you I shared think, what happened that day. You know, you, how was your day? You shared what was going on in school. You shared what it was that was happening, you know, on the block or in the neighborhood. That was the time, that was the opportunity for people to really to catch up, you know, with each other, whether or not somebody was at work, somebody was at school, you know, whatever the case may be, you brought mm -hmm. the, the good right. news to the table. And sometimes it was some not so good news, but it was at that table when mm -hmm. we came together that connected, you know, us, okay? Right. And in our house, it was breakfast also. So when mm -hmm. um, I say the first first set of children that we raised, you know, they they didn't know what it was like um, to have cold cereal. So I fixed a mm -hmm. hot breakfast um, with Josiah and Sojourner every morning um, before they went to school. And so when um, Josiah got older, and one time I came in his room and he had a box of Fruit Loops. I almost had a fit. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, he can do that. He can do that now. Um, so even to start the day, mm -hmm. right? To start yeah. that day. Yeah. And, that, and that's one thing that uh, when we start looking at heart disease, we look at diabetes risk, we're, we're, we're trying to promote people to eat healthier and things like that. Some of those things that we take for granted um, it, that we did when we were coming up in the past, we're trying to get people to understand when you eat healthy and you develop a healthy lifestyle for yourself, it passes through the family. As you eat, as you change, other people catches on and it becomes a family culture to eat healthy. So it, you know, like I said, for, for our family, it, it, it becomes something that we learn from each other. We pass recipes around. And when it comes to really watching your health, saying this is good for, you know, to eat and then passing that recipe and it's tasting good. And then you teach somebody else how to learn it. That's how you develop a culture of healthy eating. So I usually don't profess one diet over another. I usually say you want to try to 
create a healthy eating lifestyle and a healthy eating culture. So my daughter shares all of those good dishes. So anytime she has something from you, she says, oh, come on, mama, taste this. <laughs> you know, I get to know so much about different um, vegan foods and what's out there from my daughter, bringing them mm. to me and really creating that lifestyle. She told me that she purchased um, fat, farro, farro um, grain. Mm -hmm. As soon as I saw it, I had it and I've been eating farro grain this week and it's, it's delicious. And so, yeah, it, passing in that love of family. The other thing that came out is a soul food. Um, people have been really talking um, this year because, you know, this is National Nutrition Month about the importance of soul food and that uh, context behind the food and mm -hmm. the context of people coming together and eating the traditional mm -hmm. foods and that type of thing. We can make them healthier, but we don't have to give them up because it means so much more than just the food itself. It means love, it means tradition, it means family, you know, so many different connections that, um, that making them healthier is one thing. And some of the vegetarian foods are now part of soul food. When I make my vegetarian dishes I used to bring to my family gathering, it used to be like I'm bringing it for Vanessa. Everybody's eating and Vanessa's eating. <laughs> now I just make more because they look at that as just another item and they really are looking for some of those vegetarian dishes to be there you know i want to i want to bring joy in i'm going to call an audible here we're at 358 i'm going to we're going to keep going we had a little technical difficulty early on so if everybody can can our guests stay for a little bit longer can you guys stay a little bit longer and if anybody has to drop off we can we will we will respect your dropping off but this discussion is so good i just want to keep it going go all night and all all afternoon all night <laughs> Chef Joya, I want to ask you though. I, I want it with, especially with your mother here, and it's like we often do. We love the with the mother daughter pairs. How has your mother influenced you in your journey around food? Mm -hmm. We talked about early veganism, but how has that related to how you cook for others with that faith, family, and community perspective? Um, it her her influence is definitely um, because she had to. Um, she would cook foods that we would have to enjoy. And then she, my mom was always like really, really busy. Um, and then when she did have the time, the way she would bring us together would be over food. Um, so, you know, she will make, you know, I always remember she will be cornbread, mac and cheese, she'll do chunks, gravy, biscuits. So she would have like these staple foods that she will always bring together. Um, she will, that she will always cook for us to come together. And anybody that knows my mom knows that I used to call it the community house because everybody can always any you didn't even have to know them. <laughs> if you was hungry, come eat. If you want to come celebrate Kwanzaa, if you want to come do everything, just come on over to the Courtney's house. And so that that has influenced my life and even into me evolving into a chef is because I would do the same things with my friends and and that's what actually, you know, I was actually doing sh personal chef things like having dinner parties, having people over hosting, you know, I was actually doing my career before I was getting paid for my career. And so now I do those exact same things, those same mm -hmm. gatherings, and I do those in other people's homes. Or, you know, I teach people now, like even the recipes, uh, Miss Yvonne was just speaking about the soul food. My, my best selling cookbook is vegan soul food. And it's yeah. every that you have now I'm actually working on part two but it's, it's everything that you have now but just vegan so like it has baked mac and cheese blackberry cobbler potato salad coleslaw fried chicken uh southern fried fish it has uh, I call it nacho mama's meatloaf um country style oxtails uh rice pilaf um mm -hmm. South Bay, candy yams it just has black and white greens everything it's like whoa <laughs> So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, I remember when, um, when, can you hear me? When, yeah, when I first had Joya's food in, in, um, Sakia told me, she's like, Venus, um, she better than I am. That's just what you said. You said she, she has surpassed me, um, and so I really don't appreciate you making me hungry right now. That's all I really wanted to say. 
I really don't appreciate it. And um, because you did that, I just look forward to you coming back to Milwaukee and nourishing me. Um, I, I, so. I gotta say, I, I was watching Ms. Zakia, Seth Joya, and, and Mama's proud. I can just, I could just see the pride in, in Mama's face. Hey, Ms. Savan, I wanna ask you though, because I, I think this is important. And, and we're talking about this family and the foods and materials. What is it about people who eat together they seem to do better as a family and is their health better or is it is it more about that intentional eating when they are mindful about their eating what is behind that well i always don't, don't miss a chance to probably bring up social capital and the work that i'm doing for my doctorate and it all my even my thought about it um tended to come from the idea of you know, how do people do when they don't have that connection? And I, I think about how connected I am to my my family and my sisters and brothers. People see me, they'll say, where's where's Linda? Where's Rita? Where's Vanessa? Where, you know, anytime I walk in or if we come together, they, oh, they're here because they know who my family is and, and they're used to seeing us together. But then I thought, how does someone do when they don't have those social connections. Mm -hmm. And they started looking at social capital, your, your social bonds, your connections to you know, health, your connections to community. You know, how do people do? And they found out that not being socially connected can be just as bad for your health as cigarette smoking or lack of physical activity. Just uh, not being socially connected. And that when people, like they even looked at um, some of the people who are living to be 100, and they mm -hmm. found that one of the biggest things yeah. that they had was a sense of community and belonging. Right. And they socialized. And that mm -hmm. socialization around food, people eat healthier and they eat better when mm -hmm. they eat with someone. And mm -hmm. that it, they started looking at people um, getting homebound meals. Mm -hmm. The idea that that person bringing them a meal would stand there and talk to them and socialize with them. Those seniors that were getting the homebound meals, yes, they got extra food, but they also mm -hmm. got socialization. And they found, you know, that when they started saying that they wanted to change that system, not only the, the um, seniors rebelled, but the workers, because that was mm -hmm. their connection too to other people and that, that need for each other. So food is definitely more than just the vitamins yeah. and minerals. And so that connectedness piece of it is so right. important. If you're talking about changing and having a culture of health and wellness, when you don't have the connection, sometimes you don't care what mm -hmm. you eat mm -hmm. or how much you eat mm -hmm. or whether you eat at all. Mm -hmm. That's really been evident, you know, during this uh, year of the pandemic, you know, uh, and really felt sorry for seniors in particular who were cut mm -hmm. off, you know, from their family because of it. And, you know, I've heard stories of people who said they haven't seen their parents in, in a year or they haven't hugged their grandchildren in a year. And just the thought of that, you know, was not was not good. That was one of the reasons we came down here too, because <laughs> we yeah. did at this time, we did not want to be that disconnected that far away, you know, from family. We get, you know, great family and friends in Milwaukee, you know, but the grandchildren that were uh, teenagers, uh, 15 and under, you know, most of them were, were down here. So yeah, it makes a difference. And when you come together around food, and I would be uh, negligent not to talk about my son, who's also a vegan chef. He has a vegan food truck uh, here in Charlotte too. Um, that, that when we do come together, you know, it is about, you know, the food, it is about, you know, sharing uh, with right. each other, you know, being able to, you know, show that it can be a difference. Mm -hmm. Even in my extended family now, you know, uh, we're, when mm -hmm. we first became, you know, uh, vegan, it was kind of hard to, for them to accept, but now they look for it. It's mm -hmm. like, well, where's that, you know, where's that stuff? Right. <laughs> where's mm -hmm. that stuff you made with the barbecue sauce? Or where's that, you know, stuff, whatever, yeah. you know? Uh, and as they've gotten older, they've, they've called and asked for recipes you know, and things like that too, because they know it could be beneficial, you know, to them. But you know, the garden serves that purpose. And so, oh, yeah. you know, the 
the the feeling that people have towards the garden. I, I had to had a talk with another um, gentleman that I'm working on another project for, and he said, "What is all this stuff about the garden? The garden? The garden?" I'm thinking. He's thinking everybody's gardening at the garden. And I'm thinking, <laughs> after people come to the garden, they never garden at all. But they come there for the, the socialization, but they also learn from there. And they appreciate, learn to appreciate, you know, health and wellness. And, you know, it's just a different atmosphere and mm -hmm. a safe atmosphere. Right. Our tagline is, you know, we say we use gardening as the carrot pun intended, <laughs> to get people to come through the gate to impact their entire quality of life. Mm. Um, and that's the tagline to the garden. The last thing I want to say, because my phone's getting ready to go dead, is what okay. Vanessa put in the, um, the chat is, you know, our ministry. So by profession, I'm a Lutheran minister and our ministry is the table. And we worship um, in the garden or wherever we are on Wednesday evenings um, but it's, it's worship around a meal. So mm. we're not your traditional, um, faith community by no means. I mean, it's a table that actually operates the garden. Um, and so even, you know, we just practice practicing what you teach and what you preach is so important. Um, and so we recognize that all conversations, um, in our ministry need to, as many as possible need to take place while, while sharing a meal. Um, it just transforms everything. It's true. Wonderful. Uh, uh, Chef Joy, I want to start with you to give us a thought about what you would hope for for people who are listening around food. What would be your hope that you would you would get you would get leave us with? <laughs> um, um, what is the thought? Um, I was like, do I have to go first? <laughs> I always get so odd with these questions. Like, leave me with the motivational word. Um, let my mom go first, if you don't mind. <laughs> Zakia, give us a thought on what you would hope for people to take away from this experience today. Uh, I would say peace mm. and love. All right, because those two things uh, in particular that we need in this world today and it's healing. Mm -hmm. We need love so that we can be at peace, not only with ourselves, but with each other and with the rest of the, the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Venus, you, do you have a, do you have a thought around that as well? Well, you know, we've been saying it the whole time, bring your family back to the table. Yes. yes. Bring your family back to the table. And, you, and we're not saying bring your family back to the table and eat vegan food. Bring your family back to the table and eat a pot of beans. Right. If bringing your family back to the table starts with fast food, so be it. If bringing your family back to the table um, starts with something you pull out of a box, if it's a, if it's a whatever, um, because it's the gathering uh, and, and, the, and what happens, and then build from there. Um, yeah. Talk about food, learn about food, again, um, if you've ever been in our home, our house looks like a library and people knock on the door because you can see the books through the window and they ask if it's a library. Um, but one of the things that I like about this book is understand that every um, piece of food has a story, right? So it's not just about the beans in here. It's about the story and the history of the bean. And I can pull out books like this for corn and for greens and for potatoes. I have a book that's just, it's huge. It's a potato and rice Bible. And it has every single potato and every grain of rice in the world in that book. So wow. bring your family back to the table, learn your own stories, and then learn the stories of your food. If you learn the stories of your food, you'll eat differently. Right on. Joya, back to you, and then I'm going to give it to Yvonne to take us out. <laughs> All right. Um, mine's just super simple, and it's just in general, um, I have a thing with being kind um, and understanding that everyone is on a journey. Everyone has a different story. Everyone is in a different lifestyle. So, you know, always, you know try to have grace and to be kind because you never know what journey that soul is on. Right. Um, Ms. Yvonne, take us out with some thoughts. Well, my thoughts is just, this has been wonderful. 
I've taken notes on all different types of um, new protein um, sources that I'm going to be trying out. Um, I've looked at, you know, the idea of coming back to the, the table. And I did uh, uh, one thing even in doing this program that I, I, I cleaned off my table and <laughs> kitchen and me, my daughter came over and we sat there in the kitchen at the table talking and I'm not going back. You know, some people's table is just full of junk. They don't sit at the table. <laughs> the tables are just junk tables. I'm going to use my table again as a table and do just that. And so thank you so much for coming. I just want to mention that our next program is April 14th. And that um, program, we're going to be doing Back to the Kitchen with Dairy. Again, this is all part of the Back to the Kitchen curriculum. And we're going to be having um, Bridget, uh, Bridget Wilder, and everyone knows she's been a hot um, new dietitian. She's um, putting fitness, wellness, and mindfulness all together. And then we also are going to be um, having uh, Frederick um, Coleman, Chef Frederick. And we're going to really be um, jumping into that calcium connection. So uh, I look forward, and then it's going to be uh, the um, 2 o'clock to 3.30. Um, there is just a couple of takeaways that was really put in there. Um, that it, New protein sources, um, again, make sure that you have an open mind. And like I said, it's not like we're saying people have to just jump into it but it's, it's a good thing to start looking at that and then also making sure that you have those conversations with your family get to know you know how people are doing even call them up we actually had a zoom just with the family and mm -hmm. was able to see people from all over the country that connectedness is so important so thank you everyone David did you want to kind of have a final word I just want to thank Chef Joya, Sakia Courtney, Venus Williams for being an inspiration to for connecting food to community. And of course, um, Yvonne Greer, thank you for your friendship and for your collegiality and for just continued advocacy for all communities around food and around all things for health. I am your host, David Nelson, and this is the Days of Learning podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Bye. Take care.